So uh, I'm extremely glad to introduce our speaker today, Professor Alexander Paul, um, who is currently a professor of statistics and also the chair in the Department of Statistics um, at the University of California, uh, Davis. Um, Professor Paul got his uh, bachelor degree and a PhD degree both from uh, Germany. So he got his bachelor degree in mathematics from Phillips University of Harvard and a PhD degree in applied mathematics from the University of Cologne. Um, uh, Professor Ollie is absolutely uh, one of the most established researchers in the field of time series. Uh, he has made a uh, number of contributions to uh, particular uh, approximate and high dimensional time series models. So I'm not a time series guy, but I have studied his papers. Um, so Professor Ollie is currently uh, Professor Ollie is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and also a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. He's also to third mentor in 2016. He got the UC Davis Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Mentoring Undergraduate Research. Uh, he also serves on um, the editorial board of a number of journals, in particular, he's currently an AES uh, Annals of Statistics. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you very much. That was a far too kind introduction. He set me up for failure in the talk, so I can only disappoint you now. <laughs> uh, um, but I'll, I'll try my best. So uh, this talk today is based on, on work with a uh, former PhD student of the Bashish Paul and mine, Ho Wan Lee, and Jia Pang, who is also a um, colleague of mine at UC Davis. Uh, the, the talk has a, a very bulky title. I've tried to make sure that in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I'm going to walk you through all the, the different aspects of what is written down there in these three lines. Um, before I start, I realized how old I am. I, when I came here, um, I, I thought it was 2015 when I gave the last time a talk here in the, in the statistics seminar. Turns out Mosen corrected me, it was 2009. So you can extrapolate um, uh, how old I think I am and how old I really am from, from, from that one. Um, so let's go. I would like to motivate um, what comes in the next uh, few minutes by going to one of the um, data examples that we studied um, in the context of, of the modeling. Um, and in particular, we've been looking at this data from the Human Connectome Project, where uh, we looked at uh, one, about 1,000 healthy young adults. And we look at different variables uh, on behavior, so alertness, cognition, emotion, sensory perception, and, and others. And then we also look at uh, brain measurements, surface area, grain metal volume, tissue thickness. Um, for different like cortical and subcortical regions. And the, the idea that some of these people in neuroscience have is you would like to see whether certain volumetric measurements associate with behavioral traits. Okay, and we want to build a model that could somehow shed light on um, a question like that. So here's just a, a quick picture of the of the brain functions and um, somehow, uh, so these, these things are, are predefined by, by researchers in that field, um, and we can see what we can, can do with that. So first, the whole data set is quite large, um, so we pre-screen and we focus on 127, so that's the dimensionality of the, of the um, covariates that we're looking at, and those are the um, the axis in the end in our model. So we're removing highly correlated variables first, and then we have roughly 100. So let's call that roughly, uh, it's not quite high dimension, but it's at least um, something that is significant compared to the sample size. So the, we, can, we can look at this in a, in a little bit. And then also there's a certain selection of volumetric measurements. Um, we focus on some, um, that are related to 14 cerebral lobes and 38 subcortical um, anatomical structures. And then we would like to formulate a regression model for that. We use the behavioral measurement as the response and the brain vol volume measurements as predictors. Um, what 
we found out when we did the original data analysis is that there's a possibility of many unobserved factors that still play a role. So when you fit any kind of regression model, you look at the residual covariance matrix that has a very spiked structure. So there's a lot of other stuff going on that you don't really have, have explained. So we would like to have a testing framework that can um, attach to, to these kind of, of peculiar, maybe, or maybe natural um, things that show up in practice. All right, so that's kind of the, the background. Um, so now just the themes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about high dimensional linear models. I talk a bit more about spike covariance and how to deal with estimating, for example, in that situation. We would like to talk about the high dimensional situation. There's many different ways of taking asymptotics in that environment. Um, the approach that we're taking is random matrix theory based. So this means that in the limits and the asymptotics that we're taking, the dimension and the sample size grow proportionately. Okay. Um, so we need to do regularization in that framework, and that regularization is based on um, a decision theoretic framework. We're going to talk about Bayesian, uh, the base test, and the minimax solution in in a way to figure out how to regularize certain things, and then in the end, um, we're going back to the HCP data set. Okay, so that's just um, to set up the notation. So we have a, a vector y. And we would like to represent these observations in the typical uh, linear structure. So we have a parameter matrix P, it's P by M. We have um, predictors X. Um, the, the matrix there has a certain rank M. And then we have errors epsilon I. So in the standard setting, there would just be IID. But to account for... Um, the possibility of, of latent factors being involved, we're making a slightly different assumption on their structure. So we assume that there is a, a factor model for the epsilon i's, um, which is given in these with the factor loadings D and in the um, latent factors F. And then after that, we have the typical IID mean zero variance one entries uh, vectors with a certain scaling parameter sigma. Yep, so that's supposed to take into account what we observed in this data example, that your epsilons have a, a different uh, perhaps structure. Okay. All right. So now it becomes a little uh, general. So we are interested in hypothesis of a general type. And so we want to test whether uh, coefficient B times a certain constraint matrix C is equal to zero under the null hypothesis or if that's not the case under the alternative. Okay, so let's see uh, some uh, matrix with rank Q. We want it to be estimable from data. Um, just for, for the sake of, of illustration, let's go for um, two sample tests, which is a special case of what is sitting here, two sample for equality of means. In this case, your Ys are sampled from, from two subgroups or two populations, and they have two different perhaps means, mu1 and mu2. And so you can rewrite this in the framework that is given. So you have B as the, the matrix that has two columns, the two mean vectors, and then C is just identifying um, which, so basically the one minus one matrix there, and X, the Xs are group memberships. And then the hypothesis that we're testing is just whether the mean difference is equal to zero or not. So keep this thing in the, in the back of your head when um, the general formulations are there. And you can write down similar things for MANOVA, testing significance of predictors, testing linear trends, and, and other things. Okay. All right. So here is the, the spike covariance structure. Um, in, in any case, uh, I, I was told that I should be relatively intuitive because a lot of PhD students and graduate students are sitting here. So don't hesitate to, to ask me questions, right? So that, that slows me down if I go too fast and I can, I can um, backtrack a little bit. Okay, so this observational noise epsilon that we have, it has zero mean and it has a covariance that looks like this. So we're calling the covariance matrix sigma P 
that carries on how, how large the dimension is. And then we have this factor structure, D, D transposed, and then the isotropic component is sitting back there. Okay. So, in other words, if I look at the spectrum, the eigenvalues of that covariance structure, this has this, what is called the, the spiked eigenvalues, is something that Ian Johnston from, from Stanford has talked a lot about in the last 20, 25 years. Um, what it means is there is a group of, of eigenvalues, L1 up to capital L capital K, that are larger than the isotropic variance sigma squared. So they are sticking out of what's called the bulk, and you have to treat them somewhat differently. The number K is in practice, of course, also unknown and has to be, be guessed from, from the data. Um, and we talk about this in terms of the applications later on. Um, here is a picture, and this explains uh, what is happening in this case. So in each of these cases, in, in both of these cases, we're talking about IID observations. On the left, you see no spikes. So this is a covariance matrix that just looks like the identity matrix sigma square scaled to be one in this case. And what you have plotted is the sample eigenvalues of a identity population covariance matrix. So all of these should guess the one. That's how these are the eigenvalues, but it doesn't, right? So it's a, there's a big spread about that. And that spread can be explained, and I come to the description of this in a little bit, but you can see the theoretical distribution asymptotically um, given right here, and that's called the marchenko pasteur law, something that um, was derived in the 1960s. And what you can see in this histogram already is that this is a relatively accurate um, approximation, even for this finite sample case that you're seeing here. The interesting thing is that the form and shape of that limit distribution only depends on the relationship of P and N. Right? So under an assumed convergence of P over N to some number of gamma, it's called the aspect ratio, as P and N go to infinity, you get this curve and it's indexed only by one parameter. The situation that we're facing in, in this talk today, however, is more like in this, this picture on the right. You still see the marchenko pasteur kind of behavior over here, but we have certain, a certain number of sample eigenvalues that are much larger perhaps than the bulk of the eigenvalues which would predict in the marchenko pasteur So that's different and then certain other techniques have to be invoked later on, okay? So that's how it would behave under isotropic noise. This is how it behaves under the data example that we see, not with one spike, but with a lot more of them. Okay, so let's understand where, where this histogram here on the left-hand side comes from. Um, so what we would like to do then is we would like to understand how these eigenvalues behave under this P over N to gamma aspect ratio situation, right? So good for us is that the eigenvalues are real of these covariance, sample covariance matrices. Um, however, when you look at them as a, uh, as a function of P and N, these matrices grow in size. So there isn't a fixed matrix space that is underlying, like in classical statistics, the dimension is fixed and you're just adding observations and you get more degrees of freedom and things become better in this situation. Here, this is not gonna happen because there is no accumulation of degrees of freedom, right? Whenever you're adding a new observations, you're getting a longer vector in that asymptotic regime. Okay, so the way out is to look at the empirical spectral distribution rather than at the matrices. So what you're doing is for any kind of, of matrix um, that you have there, you look at the fraction of eigen oops, the fraction of eigenvalues that are to the left of a point X. So that's like a, a step function that encodes where these eigenvalues are sitting on the on the real line. Okay. So that empirical spectral distribution is what you study to, to understand large sample behavior in, in random matrix theory. And uh, linear spectral statistics, for example, the so functions of the eigenvalues of, of the sample covariance matrix, linear functions of that, they can also be understood in terms of this empirical spectral distribution, and that's what helps to understand what, what we're going to do here. Okay, so 
this is just a distribution function, and then you can you can do certain things. Okay. To make it even more illustrative, I stole this example from one of Ian Johnston's um, review papers. So this is a very simple situation, not particularly high dimensional. Um, so I have a 10 dimensional standard Gaussian random vector, mean zero, and I have a 10 dimensional identity matrix as my population covariance. And I'm only able to take 10 observations in this case. So my P over N is equal to one in that case. Um, all the eigenvalues on the population are one. And now I simulate from this, I compute the sample covariance matrix. I look at the eigenvalues of that object. And I see that in a typical sample, you have something that spreads over three orders of magnitude. You have a lot of values that are kind of small and closing up on, on zero, and then something that tails off to the right-hand side. And in this particular um, simulation, we're on the largest value is three. Okay, so if you see this, um, maybe you would say the population eigenvalues are different from, from one and from each other. Uh, the questions that you can ask is, is this gonna go away? With larger N and P, um, it's not going to, and then can it be explained? Okay, it can be explained, and the explanation follows after showing this histogram. So this is the same situation, just P and N are both increased to 1,000. So that keeps this aspect ratio that we had before constant, it's still one. And you can see this pileup effect, lots of very small eigenvalues out here on the left, and then it goes out to about four. And you can see how, how that behavior starts to shrink when the aspect ratio decreases. Now the aspect ratio is one half. I have only half the dimension left before. This pileup effect at zero starts to disappear and still so tapers off, but it doesn't go out to four anymore. It goes out to a value that's somewhat less than three. And you continue doing this. This is a one quarter aspect ratio. No pileup at zero anymore, something larger than two. And finally, this is the situation that roughly compares with the data example where, where that I mentioned before, where P was 100 and some and N was 1000 and some, so it's about 10%. And there's still quite a significant spread about the population eigenvalues. So there's no, uh, not necessarily in this asymptotic setting, a, a consistent estimation of those numbers. Okay. All right, so how do we explain this? And now a little bit of um, a theoretical slide. If I have X's observed, P dimensioned, oops, that was too fast. Um, and then this is the, the minimal assumptions. You have IID X's as the entries there. They are centered, standardized, and they have finite fourth moments. Oh, I didn't run it enough before I sent it to Judith last night. So under this one here says under the, um, under the uh, P over N to gamma scenario, you can look at the uh, empirical spectral distribution, which is the distribution function of that histogram that you saw before. These, thing, these things converge to a limiting distribution that's only indexed by the aspect ratio gamma. That thing is non-random um, and it has a density. So if gamma is less than one, this means that um, you don't have a, you don't have zero eigenvalues piling up. So in this case, you can write down what the density actually is. But density okay, has this, this, this closed form. Importantly, it's, it's compactly supported on an interval AB. And that interval itself, again, only depends on the aspect ratio. So let's plug in gamma equals one. So then your left endpoint of the distribution would be zero and the right endpoint would be four, which is kind of very much exactly like what we saw in the, in the actual histogram. And that's a, that's a phenomenon that's actually true. So you can estimate the right endpoint with the largest eigenvalue, very, very precise, more precise than you can estimate something in the middle. That's something that a guy from UC Davis figured out in the math department, Tracy, Tracy Widom, that's um, um, a theorem named after him. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but in a way, anything that's not in this idiosyncratic bulk, any signal would stick out, would be larger than four, 
And then this would basically violate the null hypothesis of, of idiosyncratic noise if you work on a test or something like that. All right. And if gamma is larger than one, so you have more dimensions than you have observations, you're adding this, this point mass at zero with corresponding weight, and otherwise you have the same density as before. Okay. If I put the um, this, this together, then the eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix spread about the population counterparts, even in that random matrix limit. However, if I allow P over N to go to zero, and then the largest and the smallest eigenvalue both converge to one, and you get basically the, the classical solution back. You can see this if, if gamma goes to zero, the, the left and right endpoint here in this interval, they, they just collapse to the one point where you want to be. Kind of what we saw when we let gamma smaller in these, in these pictures that I showed you. Okay. And so maybe instead of writing this all down, I should have just shown you this, this picture here, color code exactly as in the, the previous histograms. And you can see how the, the shape of the theoretical distribution um, matches the shape of the, the histograms that we've seen. And I think the, the, the red one here corresponded to the, the very early one. So the P over N equals one half had the spike sticking out. Okay, so this is kind of understood. There is um, algorithms to compute these or estimate these eigenvalues from, from data. Um, and we want to go back now to the solutions to the original hypothesis testing problem. And that's a lengthy slide. Don't worry too much about the, the technical details. So if you look at the expressions, all of you have heard about uh, the full model residual covariance and then hypothesis sum of squares and cross products and so on. So these are, these are just um, algebraic uh, formulations of these, these things. Um, you have to compute those and you look at the spectrum of SH times S4 inverse and the eigenvalues of this thing will tell you something about like the likelihood ratio type uh, um, statistic. I'm going to go into this. Okay, so just uh, for to make it maybe a little bit more clear, there is the least squares estimator of the hypothesis BC sitting right there. There is also the hat matrix of the reduced model. Um, and in this particular situations, there's, there's other names for it. So SS within and SS between come up when you talk about the one-way MANOVA. Okay, so these simplify in special situations. Okay, so now towards the likelihood ratio test. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at eigenvalues of the full S, we call them tau 1 up to T tau P, and these have eigenvectors we call P, and then the reduced um, covariance matrix has eigenvalues alpha and eigenvectors Q. Okay, so in the a classical setting where P is kept fixed and N is relatively large compared to it. And this was already figured out in the 1950s by Anderson and Rubin. If you look at the um, likelihood ratio to statistics, which is this object written down here, you can basically get an estimator for that by looking into the spike directions, estimating the, the tau j's in this direction. And the same thing for the reduced one, you're estimating all the uh, values in the, in the spike directions, and then you're basically averaging over the idiosyncratic directions. You don't do it individually, but you're doing it jointly. Okay? And that, that is understood from a theoretical point of view that has, for example, allows you to, um, in a fixed P setting, set up your usual chi-square approximations and you can reject at any level alpha if n times your LRT is larger than the corresponding um, quantile from the chi-square distribution with the uh, right amount of, of degrees of freedom. Okay, so if P was fixed and, and um, sample size would go to infinity, that's the way that you would, would deal with it. Um, however, when P is roughly similar to N, then complications come up. So the, the quality of sigma hat full as an estimator for sigma P in high dimensions is somewhat questionable. 
Um, so let's look at this again. Sigma P with the spikes has eigenvalues L1 up to LK, and then sigma, or this one should be a sigma square, first one, and then eigenvectors H. But if I look at the leading sample eigenvalues and compare them to those Ls, then they are systematically biased upwards, and I can write down what exactly that, that upward bias looks like. So the tau j's, they do not estimate the LJs, but they add something to it. And what you're adding there has to do with the aspect ratio. So the, the larger the aspect ratio, the more you're going to add to it. And then there is some sort of a signal to noise sitting down here. This ratio LJ over sigma square tells you how much the spiked eigenvalues sticks out from the idiosyncratic part of the, of the histogram. The larger um, LJ is compared to sigma square, the smaller the bias becomes. The closer LJ sits to the right endpoint of the idiosyncratic Moschenko posture part, the smaller uh, the smaller this number, the the smaller the denominator is, and the larger the bias becomes. Okay, so this is again something that can be written out, and this is something that would not show up in the classical setting from before. It gets worse. If you look at the um, population eigenvectors versus sample eigenvectors, you get that the projection of them. So if you look at the inner product of uh, the population and sam sample ones, then again, they are, there is an angle, there is a function of, again, this how far it's sticking out in the aspect ratio. This is a more complicated expression. And really want to write it out, but the angle is not zero in general. So that's what you should take from that. And there's more you can write down technically a decomposition of these leading sample eigenvectors where you have a, a fraction. This is a weight WJ that is again looking like the zeta function up here that uh, uh, projects basically onto the, the truth. And then you have some fluctuations that are normal and some fluctuations that are somewhat uniform. And this comes from the projection onto the spikes and the orthogonal complement to the spikes. So this eigenvector estimation is a very cumbersome thing. There's no convergence to this in high dimensions and it can get almost arbitrarily bad. And so it is good to have um, statistics that only depend on the eigenvalues because you can do something about correcting the bias but you cannot really do anything about estimating the correct version of the, of the eigenvectors. And the last thing that you can figure out is when you look at the MLE of sigma squared, then this is biased downwards. So you typically think that there's less idiosyncratic noise than, than you see. And again, there is an explicit form of this where the, the form of that bias only again depends on aspect ratio and strength of these spikes. So this is the situation that we're facing. We face the situation that we understand the fluctuations of the eigenvalues um, inside the bug. That's Moschenko posture. We understand how difficult it is to say something about estimating those spiked eigenvalues. We understand if the spike gets bigger, it is easier. We understand that if the spike is sitting right at the edge of the Marchenko posture spectrum, then it becomes almost impossible because the bias will dominate everything else. Okay. And we can forget about what is written down there about the eigenvectors because we're only talking about eigen eigenvalues. Okay, so that's good. All right, so now we're in the situation that we can talk about modifying the classical likelihood ratio test and try to do something about regularization. So the likelihood ratio statistics is this guy here. And if you look at the, the right-hand side formulation, this SH is something that tells you something about how far away from the null hypothesis you're going to be. And S full inverse is the coordinate scaling. So where do we propose the regularization? So what we want to do is we want to take this matrix and we want to replace it with a regularized version. So notice that we have SH, but this is not really a high dimensional object. 
the only high dimension object that sits in here is this S inverse full. So it makes sense that the regularization would be put on that. Okay, and then this is just keeping the spike structure and putting weights on the corresponding spike directions. And these are all collected in this capital lambda. There's K plus one of them, where the first entry, the lambda zero, it tells you what you're doing in the idiosyncratic directions. So these are regularization parameters. They don't have, all have to be positive, right? So the only thing that's required here in that sense is this parameter cannot be negative. But there are certain ranges of lambdas allowed where the a few of them could be negative. So, for example, lambda one up to lambda k could be equal to negative lambda zero. And then your estimation would basically be the projection onto the idiosyncratic noise subspace. So, you forget about everything that you're seeing from the spike and you're only estimating the other part. Okay. So keep this in mind because this thing will come back later on a theoretical level. It's kind of interesting and unexpected as a, as a finding. Okay, but there's a class of matrices in all these omega lambdas that are supposed to regularize the high dimensional object that is difficult to guess. Okay. Okay, so let's see if and how we can do this. So first step is this is what we need. This is what, what we will do instead. And then this is like a couple of random matrix theory steps that are coming. We would like to symmetrize this object and then go over to this matrix M of lambda, which has exactly the same non-zero eigenvalues of the scaling as the, as the original matrix. So understanding the eigenvalues of this object means we understand the one that we're interested in. Okay. Now you crunch your random matrix theory machinery, and then you can see that under the null hypothesis, no matter what your regularization parameters are, as long as the idiosyncratic component is non-zero, we have a defined convergence. So this, this matrix uh, converges to a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So that's a, a random uh, a matrix in the limit where it basically has entries that are all IID Gaussian with variance two on the diagonal and with variance one on the off diagonal. So this is understood. So you can um, use this to come up with your asymptotics. And in particular, these normalization um, parameters, the thetas, they have explicit expressions and you can estimate them consistently from the data. So that's nice. I don't write down what the exact expressions are. They're a bit lengthy but um, this can be done. So it has a nice behavior in the limit and this can be used. Okay, so now we're back. We can look at the likelihood ratio statistics where the object here has been replaced by the M because the eigenvalues do exactly the same thing. This is rotation invariant. It's nice, we don't have to take care of the eigenvectors, right? So we don't need to uh, worry about it. And then, we can, from the previous result, we can figure out what's happening under the null hypothesis. So BC is equal to zero. No matter what your regularization scheme will be, can be arbitrarily bad, but it still will converge to this normal distribution here. Um, so we can reject the null hypothesis at a particular level alpha if we compare against the standard normal quantile. Okay, so. From the simulations that we did, we find that this is typically well controlled if the magnitude of lambda zero is not all too different from the ones that we're using in the, in the spike directions. However, if this lambda zero is small, so this means that most of the stuff, most of the variation is sitting in these spikes, then we can employ a parametric bootstrap procedure that works better. The underlying reason for this is that there's a skewness in the, in the finite samples um, and the bootstrap adjusts better to this than, than the limiting distribution would. And here are some pictures of this. So again, I'm showing you um, results for uh, the two sample case. The two samples of sample size 40 and 60 and there's three spikes. And then you can use different specification of your, of your noise, normal, blue, uh, blue is T4, and then so on. And different 
uh, dimensions. So 50, 200, and 1,000. So P over N is quite large for the last case. Um, and then I plot basically the standard normal PDF and the bootstrap null back there. And you can see that in this case, when um, this is a hyperparameter that I'm introducing later, but this basically means that the um, that there's a bit of a of a, a imbalance between the size of the idiosyncratic regularization parameter relative to the one in the spike directions. You can see that the bootstrap distribution does pretty well, but that the normal approximation does not do so good. Um, and then if you're basically going to um, a situation where this is more balanced, so this parameter row gets closer to, to one, then both do, do pretty well and the approximations look pretty decent. So that can be employed in that case. Okay, so now let's look under the alternative and then let's say something about how to choose these parameters. Because so far, there is just a set of parameters, but we don't know which ones to, to take. Okay, so under the alternative, we can look at these quantities I tilde. So what are, what are those? They look complicated, but think about, again, if you have the two sample, then here is the, the, the mean difference sitting. Okay, so this is something like, the, like a scaled norm of, of mu1 minus mu2 for the time being. So this one here is the non-centrality parameter. And this one is basically uh, the signal strength in the J spike direction. And then the last one is the signal strength scaled with the square root of N there that is orthogonal to the spikes. Okay, so that's just a distribution of, of how, the, how the alternative would um, basically line up with the spikes and with the rest of, of the covariance structure. We're assuming like a local power. This means that uh, these pi tildes, they should regular, they should be fluctuating regularly in the sense that they go to some limits. And then we can write down what the, what the power function is. Again, this is for an arbitrary lambda. The power function is determined by this quantity over here. These, this is the aspect ratio P over N. And then this is the quantity that we saw from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble um, standardization. The numerator part is the interesting one. So this thing, again, is determined by the regularization parameters, by how the alternative lines up with a different spike and non-spike direction. This is the pi j. And then the aspect ratio plays a role and how big the spikes are. And that's the, the quantity that we want to use to say something about choosing good lambdas, right? In the end, you want lambdas that make this test as powerful as possible. Okay, so that's the goal. The power function has an explicit expression, and we would like to select regularization of these lambdas. We're going to look at the pi's and select basically accordingly. So how do we do that? Um, before we go there, let's look at how this how this shapes up for that two sample problem. So these are the the power curves. The green one is the uh, classical LRT, and you can see that there is some um, significant improvements over the classical LRT unless you are in a situation where you are basically again in the um, what is the right one? It's uh, pi zero is one. This means that there are no, no spikes, right? So everything sits in the in the directions orthogonal to the spike, but then again, doing something, trying to estimate spikes is not gonna help you out. Um, so, good. All right, so back to this local power thing. Here is the expression that determines the power of the test. And we want to choose the set of parameters that maximizes that power. Okay. We would like to use those pi's, which are the weights in a way that go into certain direction. Um, and we do exactly that. So we want to rescale because it doesn't matter. So we can rescale uh, the sum of those pi's so that they're equal to one. And so they are basically acting as weights now. 
Okay, so now the goal is to find the mini, the minimax test among the class of tests T0 lambda with regularization given in, in this set. And we're treating pi now as an equivalent class of priors on the parameter space, right? So for each um, pi j, which is the, the limit of many different pi j tilde's that could converge to, to that particular asymptotics, this would be used to assess like an initial way of, of selecting the, um, the weights. And if we're doing this, then we can very classically basically get the minimax procedure by figuring out what the base procedure looks like uh, computing the least favorable prior. And interestingly, this can be done. But it looks like a, a relatively complicated one, but it turns out that this is possible. Um, so the power is invariant under scalar multiplication, so we can set the two norm of the lambda also to be equal to one. So there's two normalizations going on. The pi's, they sum up to one, so they are like weights for like different coordinates. And I can also set the, the norm of the lambdas to be one and um, without changing the, the power of the, of the test. And so in the end, I'm restricting this to a simplex and here I have some sort of a sphere and I can try to use optimization routines that are working for these situations, okay? All right, nice. So here is the definition of a base test. Um, so any uh, test has base risk delta alpha lambda. If this thing here is satisfied, so this is just one minus the power function. Um, and then the test delta, which plugs in lambda b of pi, is a base test with, re with respect to a prior pi if this condition here is satisfied. In the second equality, I'm dropping all the stuff that doesn't affect where the argmax is taken. And so this is good. Um, and then I can compute the base selection basically by a uh, explicit version. Again, these have explicit expressions that depend on the random matrix theory uh, that is underlying much of this, but it's a, it's a nice enough expression if you want, and it can be estimated consistently from the data. So that's my, my base selection of lambda given a, a set of priors of pi. Well, Okay, so, and, and then consequently, if I plug that all in, my optimal base risk is then in this guy, which uses these expressions. Okay, so that's a very classical um, statistical decision theory kind of framework that most of you probably have seen in your math stats classes that you have to take at some point. Okay, nice. So here's the, the class of priors, and here's this hyperparameter role. Um, so my, my priors now are basically these, these pi's that are summing up to one, and we're putting some sort of a restriction in this, in this class of priors on how much of that weight we're allowing to go into the idiosyncratic directions. So this was the row equals 0.2 and row equals 0.8 that showed up in some of the initial pictures. Okay. Okay, so that's the parameter that controls this. Um, and now, just continuing with this decision theory stuff, we say that a, a test is minimax with respect to this class of priors if it satisfies this condition over here. We look at the maximum risk, and then we're taking the, the minimum over these um, regularization parameter values. All right, so the least favorable prior then is defined in, in this thing here. And then interestingly enough, it is a quadratic minimization problem. We have to look at this thing and we have to uh, minimize it with respect to this prior. Again, that's a quadratic programming problem. So we did not have to work too hard, but we could use um, what other people had done. And in the end, you have a minimax selection which is just a given down here. So importantly, 
this is not the minimum minimax test in the class of all tests, right? This is the minimax test in this particular setup that we chose. It's not like the the, the global global test. Okay. Um, and now back to this original comment on what these lambdas are allowed to be. If you restrict lambda to be positive, and if you get no restriction over here on the idiosyncratic one, the minimax test actually corresponds to doing everything on the idiosyncratic one and ignoring all the spiked um, directions entirely. And this is corresponding to Brian Taranadasar's test from, from 1996 when you, when you reduce to the two sample case. So somehow, for those of you who, who remember this test, what those guys did, they basically said, okay, I might have some uh, cross correlations there between different coordinates. It's too complicated in high dimensions to say much about it. Let's forget about it, which is using the diagonal matrix. Right? So in a way, this was a workaround. Um, but it turns out this is an optimal thing. So in, in the end, it, when, you, when you look at this decision theoretic framework, this bias analysis test falls out as the minimax optimal one in this, in this kind of thing. So that's a, a little unexpected um, and kind of a nice uh, side effect of what we wanted to do. I'm, I'm running out of time. So I had pictures here for what the single spike is doing, and then you can see what kind of base selection, least favorable prior, and minimax selection would look like in 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 pictures. So here is something, and and I can explain this maybe if if it comes back in in the questions. But let me in the last couple of minutes just go back to the the application rather than explaining those pictures. Um, so. And this is what we have. We have now um, a regression model that has to do with kind of the predictor um, variables that we wanted to pick in, put in. So we have this 127 SP, we have 82 predictors in that model. They have to do with, with all kinds of, of stuff um, in this uh, volumetric uh, measurements. And here is what you're seeing when you look at the spike covariance, right? So we didn't really plan on doing the spike covariance stuff in the beginning, but after doing these things, whatever was done, it came back with spikes. So we had to basically adjust to, to that situation. So using some available methods in the literature, you're seeing that uh, maybe you estimate uh, 12 spikes with an algorithm by Critchman and Nadler. And then a more recent paper in, in JRSSB, uh, Zhang Feng Yao and, and, and co-authors here, you can estimate the, the else and the sigma coming from that. Okay. All right, and then you can basically, for example, this is just one way of, of dealing with this. Now you could individually test for uh, possible significance of each of these um, 80 some volumetric measurements. So we can do these, these individual tests of regression parameters being equal to zero. We can use this likelihood ratio statistics that we have and choose this lambda according to the regularization scheme that we have. And just to show that this is robust against the um, specification of this hyperparameter, we choose one that's extremely small and one that doesn't make any restrictions. Um, and then we compare with Anderson and, and Rubin, which is the, the classical situation in that case. Um, what you find is that the proposed method, when you test it, no matter what the row value is, the p-values are of the same order of magnitude, with one exception on the next page. And the p-values are all significant, whereas the one for the classical likelihood ratio test are not. Um, and there's one, one example where they slightly differ by a few orders of magnitude, so there's one right there. All the others are exactly in the same way, likelihood ratio test um, it does not reject, but uh, the, the new method rejects uh, in, in, irris irrespective of the value of, of Rome. Okay, so we looked into what that means. These were only the ones that led to a rejection. In the literature, there's all kinds of possible interpretations of that. I don't really want to put too much emphasis on that. I don't understand all of what's behind it. To me, this is a model where people are trying to say something when you do a certain task, you have a certain behavior, then a certain uh, parts of your brain light up 
it seems to me that's a kind of a simplistic approach to some extent, but you have to start somewhere. Um, so there is some connection to what people in the neuroscience literature have done. And maybe it makes sense what we're finding there. Uh, don't quote me on it. I know this thing is recorded, but I deny that I said anything like that. And so just uh, to, to wrap it up, um, so I introduced uh, to you a way to analyze high dimensional linear models and test general hypotheses in that. And the theory makes heavy use of random matrix theory, even though I didn't really show you any of that in, in this talk. Um, but what we wanted is we wanted to have a, a statistically motivated a sound approach of, of doing regularization. And we're doing this in a classical decision theory framework. And what I should do is I should thank the reviewer of, of one of the papers. So somebody basically pushed us into this direction and it, it turned out to be really nice. So in the beginning, the original form of this paper did not have this decision theory framework. So one of the cases where the reviewer really, really did an excellent job and we, we can't really thank that person enough. Um, and then again, what I liked from a theoretical point of view, you, you figure out that by and so another saw actually there's some optimal, optimality attached to a, a classical test. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Oh. What was the A in your example? The what? What was the little A? Oh, so this is the uh, N minus M. So basically adjusted for degrees of freedom. Okay, so you so and, and the capital N and the little N are almost the same, right? Because the, the M is assumed fixed. So asymptotically, there's no difference. I think it was on one of the early slides. Right, so the okay, so so maybe there's a little bit um, something that I should have emphasized a little more. So the random matrix theory framework sends the coordinates to infinity at the same rate as the sample size, but the number of hypotheses that we're testing doesn't change. Right? That's a fixed quantity. Yeah. So I have a quick comment. Thank you for the nice oh, oh, thank you. I'm pleased to see Gamma Minimax in action. <laughs> this is something which is German. As, as, as I said, there was no plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the key thing there is to exchange super uh -huh. And is the problem regular? So you are essentially yeah. getting this level of prior. Yes. To produce your gum minimus. Yes, it, it is. It's a yeah. problem regular. Yeah. Yes. You can exchange to it. Yeah, it, it is. So the, 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 the interesting thing is because the, of the of this uh, form of the pies and the lambdas, you're actually in a nice structure. Right. So you're on a simplex, you're on the on the sphere, and that makes these things all, all relatively easy to show. Yeah, you, you are, you're allowed to do that. It, it is expected that you get extreme uh, uh, solution, one and zeros. What uh -huh. happens if, for example, lambda zero is zero and lambda one is one? Lambda, so one spike. So, so actually the optimal solution is always on the boundary, uh -huh. on the extremes. Yeah, yeah. And for you it is that your lambda zero is one and all others are zero. Yeah, what and this is if, if lambda it, zero is zero and lambda one is one. I see. So. First, this is this is correct, right? And this makes it makes sense that you would do this because it's most volatile in the in the spike direction because this is the largest largest eigenvalues are sitting in in that direction. So to see if the null hypothesis or the alternative is true is most difficult in the spike direction. So that's why it tries to shift weights into the um, into the the idiosyncratic space. And that's what this role is controlling, right? So we do not want all of it to fall into, into that space. So that takes care of it. And the other situation when, when you choose everything into the spikes, because of what I explained before, this doesn't happen, right? The only thing that you have to guard against is lambda naught cannot just take up everything. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, in your 
three spinning at the beginning. Um, do you have a sense of how that impacts the few values you can do? Yeah, uh, good question. So. Yeah, we have we haven't we have not checked how sensitive is it is towards that. I would assume that it it should be all right, but I would have to verify it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, something we should do. Yeah. I got a question. It's not less like our. 